for God. Today, we're going to talk about baptism. And so if you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 3. Really one of the most important teachings that Jesus gives us is he he gives the same thing to Nicodemus that we're going to read a little bit about. Saint Nick, I like to call him, Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he asks him, "What, what must I do to enter the kingdom of God? And Nicodemus is a lot like us because a lot of us think that we need to just do some more. We need to earn our salvation. That's that's what Nick thought. If I could just do a little bit more for God, I would finally be saved. And Jesus teaches him this. He says, Nick, you don't need more. You need new. And when we respond to the life that Jesus has to give us, God isn't saying you need to do more. God is saying you need something that is new. You need to turn away from your old habits, turn away from your old ideals, turn away from all the things that you used to run to, and you need to accept something that is new, a new relationship with me. And so if you'll follow along in John chapter 3, we're going to look at this new birth that we refer to as Christian baptism. The Bible says that there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, And this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who comes from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And so Nicodemus recognizes the ministry of Jesus. Jesus performed his first miracle earlier on in chapter 2 when he turned water into wine. It was one of the first signs of, of his ministry. Jesus went into the temple and he turned tables upside down because they had turned God's house into a den of thieves. Jesus had healed people. He had um, healed people who had leprosy and were paralyzed. And so people were in awe about Jesus. And he did these wonderful things that we refer to as miracles, but the biblical word is sign. And they were to authenticate the ministry of Jesus. And so here's Nicodemus stuck in a really hard spot because you got this guy named Jesus who's performing signs and miracles, but he's in conflict with a group called the Pharisees. They don't like Jesus because of what he teaches and what he stands for. He's rebuked the Pharisees and they've accused him of blasphemy. And so he decides, well, I'm going to sneak around and I'm going to find Jesus when no one else is around and I'm going to ask him a very important question. And there's something that Nick began to realize. Nicodemus realized this, I've got all the things external right, but there's something inside of me that just isn't right. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like you've come to church, you've read your Bible, you've done all the right things, but deep down inside, you know something is missing Well, that's exactly where Nicodemus has found himself. He's a Pharisee. He's obtained elite status. He's not only followed the law, but he has done his best to follow all the extra things that they've added on, all the traditions and all the rules. But deep down inside, he knows something is missing, and so he comes to Jesus to try to find out that missing piece. Look what he says in verse 3. So Jesus answered him and said, Most assuredly, I say unto you that unless one is born again, he cannot even see the kingdom of God. Unless one is born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. He says, Nick, you don't need to do more. You don't need more of what you already have. You need something that is new. And he lays down the gauntlet. Unless you are born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. Well, what does Jesus mean by being born again? Well, look at what the text says. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? I mean, that's kind of maybe a logical response. Put yourself in Nick's shoes, first century Judaism. Jesus says you've got to be born again. And the only thing that you can, you can think about about being born again is, well, how am I going to climb back into my mother's womb and be born again? But Jesus tells us what he means by being born again. Look at what he says in verse 5. Jesus said unto him, Most assuredly I say unto you, that unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now there are some people who want to interpret this in a couple different ways. The first interpretation is simply this. Jesus is saying unless you are born of water, your physical birth, and spirit, your spiritual birth, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And that really doesn't textually make sense at all. That's literally Jesus saying, unless you are physically born and born of the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. So what happens to all the children who die in the womb? So I don't really think that's exactly what Jesus is teaching here. The second reason why this isn't a really good interpretation of this passage of Scripture is because the word water here is never referred to physical birth ever throughout the Scriptures. It's never never referred to that. 
So if we were to take Jesus at face value, we simply take him at his word. Unless you're born of water and spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, if you actually look at the text in the Greek, it's really, it's really quite interesting. And it's simple. You've got one preposition of connecting a phrase. We call that a prepositional phrase. Unless you're born of water and spirit, which means one single point in time, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. So for all reasons, logically, textually, the other scriptures that we find in the Bible that we look to, we can see Jesus teaching something very simple. Nicodemus, unless you're born of water and spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Baptism is pretty important. And I don't know about you, but sometimes in my culture, people I talk to, either people seem to be on one extreme or the other. Either they teach that baptism is nothing more than a symbol, an outside uh, sign of an inward change, or they go to the other extreme. They actually teach what's called baptismal regeneration. It literally means this. There's power in the water. That when you get baptized, grace is infused into your soul because somebody has blessed the water, and it's actually the mode and the act in which salvation is imparted to you. And I think that errs on both sides. Is baptism a symbol of what takes place inside your life and in your spirit? Yes, but it's not merely that. But baptism certainly isn't some supernatural, powerful water that infuses the grace of God into you. I think we ought to take a more biblical, middle-of-the-ground approach that I believe the Bible teaches, that baptism isn't merely a symbol, but at the same time, the Bible is very clear. We are saved by grace through faith. And so how do we marry the two? Well, that's what we're going to talk a little bit more about this morning, starting off with this passage here with Nicodemus. And so we've mentioned how water was never used as physical birth. We've mentioned how this is one prepositional phrase to link water and spirit at the same time. Now, what does this new birth do? Well, let's first define what the word baptism means. Baptism comes from the Greek word baptizo. It only means this, to immerse, submerge, or plunge. It never meant sprinkle. It never meant pour. In fact, if you were to look in your dictionary today, you would find multiple definitions for baptism, right? Our English word, baptism, simply means sprinkle, pour, or immerse. But that's not what the Greeks meant when they used the word baptizo. One of the really cool things about biblical literature is that the Bible was written in what's called a dead language. You know what a dead language is? A dead language is a language that has not evolved over time. And so words that were used in their original context, still hold their value and their meaning. So you can actually look at what words were used and what they meant, and you could come away with a very clear understanding. There were other words that the Greeks had for sprinkle and pour. There were other words, and they were never used to refer to baptism. So when we talk about the mode of baptism, every single time the Bible mentions the word baptism, there's always much water there. They're always going down into the water or coming up out of the water, and the word itself always referred to immersion. So if I were to baptize my hands, what did I do with my hands? I submerged them underwater, and I washed them. If I were to go baptizing myself at a pool over the summer, what does that mean? I've immersed my entire body into the water. And so that's what the word baptism means. Now, one of my favorite passages of Scripture is in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 4. Read this with me. Paul is telling the church this. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into his death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And so here Paul says baptism is a symbol. It represents our death and burial and resurrection with Jesus. Baptism's really, really important. But while baptism, as I said earlier, is a symbol, it's not merely that. Look at what Paul connects our baptism with here in verse 4. He says, and we've resurrected with Christ at our baptism to walk in a new life. Baptism is a powerful symbol of what God does in our hearts at that time. You know what? I think about marriage. I think about my marriage to Angel. Many of us in here are are married or at least have been married before or will get married one day. And when I started to date Angel and I fell in love with her, I pledged myself to her. I knew I wanted to marry her. And so I went out and I bought a ring and I planned the perfect, you know, uh, proposal, the perfect surprise. We went to the beach and everything was all ready. And I even proposed to her. And obviously she said yes because it's irresistible, if you know what I'm saying. (laughs) 
just to her. <laughs> That's unfortunate. Um, but anyways, uh, so, so uh, yeah, my wife, man, I'm telling you, like, I feel so bad for her, Angel, my wife. She just, like, it's like, you know, when the Bible says God will, like, cause a lie to fall over their eyes and they will believe it for a short time? Like, that's exactly what happened to her. I mean, I totally married up, and I'm glad that she said yes, because that's, hey, it's me, you know what I mean? So I don't really have much to offer, but thankfully, God blessed me by giving me a wife that I can marry up to. She's awesome. But anyways, despite me being married to Angel, right, later on, I was engaged to her. I pledged myself to her. The marriage was not official until the minister pronounced us as husband and wife. And, you know, there are some times when I talk with people who talk about their salvation and their experience and how they really felt a deep change in their life when when there was a moment they got on their knees and they prayed and they felt God move in their heart. And I do not deny that or doubt that at all. Repentance is one of the most powerful things a person can experience. You feel like everything is brand new. Everything has started over. That's why repentance, as we talked about last week, is absolutely essential for salvation. The Bible says in Luke 13, if we don't repent, we will perish. But just because we've made the pledge to run towards God doesn't mean God has pronounced us married to him. That's what makes baptism so significant. It's when God makes the pronouncement, you are saved, you are forgiven. And we're gonna read a little bit more about this throughout this scripture. So we planned out our wedding. We bought rings as a symbol to marry to each other. We even set our vows, but we weren't husband and wife until God pronounced us, you are husband and wife through the mouth of the minister. And that's the same thing that happens at our baptism. Now, how about this question? Is baptism something that you do? How would you answer that? Well, it's tricky because baptism isn't necessarily something that you do. Baptism is something that somebody does to you. But let's even grant the idea that baptism is something that you do, okay? And let's follow this logic. Because baptism is something that you do, and we're not saved by works because works are defined as something that you do, that means we're not saved by baptism. Isn't that a logical argument? And so here's the question we're asking. Is baptism a work? Well, the first thing that we need to do is we need to define the word work. If we define the work as anything that you do, which is how people typically define works, we kind of place ourselves into a sticky situation. Nine out of 10 people that I talk to that believe baptism is a work do not believe that faith and repentance is a work, even though it's something that we do. And so I'll take them to John chapter 6, verses 27 through 29. The Jews asked Jesus, Jesus, what should we do that we may work the works of God? And you know what Jesus said is a work? Here's what he says. He says in verse 29, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent. And so if we take the word baptism... And we define the word work as anything that you do, and therefore baptism is a work that you do. Even faith and belief in God under that definition is a work. And so we really start to get ourselves in a sticky situation because the Bible is clear in Ephesians 2.8, isn't it? We are not saved by works. We're saved by God's grace through faith. And he even goes on to say, we're going to read it here in a few minutes. We are saved by grace through faith, not of works, so that nobody can boast, so that nobody can say, ah, look, I've earned God's salvation. Look at me. But here's the danger. If we misrepresent and misdefine what the Bible says and means by you're not saved by works, we've placed ourselves in a situation where even faith and repentance are works. And therefore, they are something that we do to earn salvation. And I think everybody in this room would agree that faith and repentance is something that we do, but it's not what we do to earn God's salvation. It's what we do to accept God's salvation. We meet these conditions that God has laid out in Scripture because we want to embrace God's grace. And here's what I tell people. Same thing. We just take it one step further because we believe that's what the Bible teaches. Yes, faith is a necessary condition, but it's not an essential condition for salvation. Repentance is necessary for salvation, but it's not the only essential condition condition for salvation. And so we believe faith, repentance at the time of baptism is the best reflection of what the Bible has to teach about the role of salvation. Our response that we need to meet God in the water. And so I would like to read to Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. Look at what Paul says, emphatically clear. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. And so what is a work? What does Paul mean when he says you're not saved by works? Here's what he means. You are not saved by any response to law code. That could be the moral law. 
If you do things in response to the moral law in order to earn God's salvation, that's not how you're saved. It could be the Old Testament law. If you obey the Ten Commands and all the Levitical laws that are found throughout the Old Testament in response to God's law code for salvation, that's not how we're saved. It's even, and this is where our movement gets a little, gets a little tricky, it's even the New Testament law code. Look, we are not saved by works. We're not saved by taking the Lord's Supper. We are not saved by singing Christian hymns. We are not saved. That is not the mode or the channel by which we accept God's salvation. We are saved by grace through faith. That's the method by which we are saved. And so we cannot respond to the ultimate extreme and say, well, grace gets you saved, but what you do keeps you there. That's not what the Bible teaches. So when we look at the proper definition of, of, of works, we need to first establish what Paul meant when he said you're not saved by works. I think it's pretty clear. Response to law code. But even look at church history. You know, for the first 1,500 years that the church was in existence, they never separated baptism from salvation. It wasn't until a guy named John Calvin and a, a Swedish guy named Zwingli came along and they redefined words that were in the original text and they created an entire different doctrine of salvation. Have you ever heard of Martin Luther? He's one of the well, most well-known reformers in the history of the church. Here's what Martin Luther had to say. He said that one is baptized so that he may receive in the water the promised salvation. Martin Luther was adamant. He was actually one of the people who stood up um, to the Roman Catholic Church at that time and said, look, we are not saved by works, we're saved by grace. Yet he had no problem saying baptism was the time of salvation. And so here's a key phrase that I would focus in on. It's simply this. Baptism is not a work that you do. It is a work that God does to you. Colossians makes this really clear. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, it says this. In him, being Jesus, you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. It's spiritual, in other words. And the removal of the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ and notice this. This is what he says. Having been buried with him in baptism, you were buried with Jesus in baptism, and then look at what happened at your baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith and the working of God who raised him from the dead. Paul simply says this. When you were baptized into Christ, God circumcises your heart, and when you were raised up out of that water, your faith met the resurrection of Jesus, and God worked on you in that moment. And that is really good news. That is great news. You know one of the reasons why we hand out baptismal certificates? is so that people can look to a point in time and say, look, man, this is when God began his work in me. Does that mean that God wasn't working on a person through the preaching of the gospel? No. Does that mean the Holy Spirit wasn't convicting a person through the preaching of the gospel when they turned away from their sins? Absolutely not. Of course God's hand is all throughout that. But we can't water down the doctrine of baptism because we may carry along false presuppositional ideas about the role of salvation in our response. And so Paul makes it crystal clear. In baptism, you were circumcised. God worked on you. And through your faith, he raised you from the dead. Martin Luther had this to say. Is baptism a work? This is, what, this is his response. To this you may answer, yes, it is, the true, it is true that our works are of no use for salvation. Baptism, however, is not our work, but God's. God's works are necessary for salvation, and they do not exclude, but rather demand faith. And Martin Luther is just the tip of the iceberg. You look at the last 1,500, the early 1,500 years of the church, nobody disconnected baptism from salvation. And so it's an important thing that we need to take away with us. Now, water baptism was so important to Jesus that I would like to share with you what some of his early apostles had to say about baptism. When we approach this, okay, when you talk about the subject of salvation, one of the worst errors that people make is they look to one scripture one scripture is all they'll look to, like Ephesians 2.8, for instance. Well, one good Bible study rule that you can take with you, right, that'll really help you as you study the Bible is simply this. One scripture doesn't say all there is to know about one subject. It is a, what's called a hermeneutical fault. Hermeneutics is a scientific approach to scripture. It is a wrong approach to scripture to simply look at one verse, isolate it, and then create an entire doctrine off of that. 
even in the medical field or the science field, physics, one of the best things that you can do is you gather all the evidence, right? You look at all the evidence and then you render your conclusion based off of the evidence provided. Well, that's the same thing that good Bible students do when they approach the scriptures. Look at what the Bible has to say about salvation. Include all of the information and then render your conclusion. Now, can we talk about all the verses this morning about the Bible and what it has to say about salvation? Of course not, right? That's why two weeks ago we talked about faith. Last week we talked about repentance. Next week we're going to talk about good works. But if we're going to be good Bible students, look to all the scriptures. And so we're going to look at some scriptures. Let's look at what the Bible has to say about baptism and then render our conclusion. Look, we already read it, John 3, 5. Jesus said to you, truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Look at Mark 16, 16. And he said unto them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. And he who has believed and has been baptized shall be, future tense, saved. But he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. Now it doesn't say he who believes and is saved shall be baptized, right? Let's just take the simple reading. On face value, what does the Bible teach? He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Well, have you noticed what the Bible scripture excluded in this passage? It says nothing about repentance. Wouldn't it be a mistake on my part to say, see, we don't even need to repent in order to be saved? Why? Because there are other scriptures that talk about the necessity of repentance. So when we approach the Bible, Look at all the evidence, render your conclusion. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations. How do you make disciples? Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teach them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. For the early apostles in the early church, we could say this. Baptism was obedience within the gospel, not works of law. You know they always included the preaching of baptism in the gospel? It was never, here's the gospel, and then here's baptism. There was, here's the gospel, and then you need to take the Lord's Supper, and you need to do Christian works and tithe. There was always a separation between good works and the gospel, but there was never a separation between the gospel and baptism because they never considered baptism a good work that you do and response to salvation. Baptism was always included in the gospel message. This is how you respond to the word of God, the word of the Lord. Let's look at what Peter had to say. Peter's a pretty important person, wouldn't you say so? Well, on the day of Pentecost, the first sermon that was ever delivered in Jesus' name was delivered by Peter. And he stands up and he preaches against the nation of Israel. And he says this, This Jesus, whom you all have crucified, God has made Lord and Christ. You're guilty of crucifying Jesus. He's Lord and he's Christ. Now, I place myself in their shoes and I can feel what they're feeling. And in verse 37, it says they were pricked to the heart. It means they were convicted. They were sick to their stomachs. The epiphany came known and they, they had this epiphany in their mind, uh-oh, we've made a really bad decision. Has that ever happened to you? <laughs> it's happened to me. And so they asked, the, they asked the apostles, Peter specifically, men and brethren, what shall we do? And you know what Peter's response was? He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent, turn away from your sin, be baptized, immersed, Baptizo. For what? What's the purpose? For the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Look, baptism is a whole lot more important than what some people give credit to. It is a very significant step in the salvation process. But I don't want to make an error and overemphasize baptism. People always ask me, what's the most important step? And you know what my response is? The next one. That's the most important one. And so faith is the logical foundation for salvation. That is the mode by which we receive God's grace. Baptism, we contend, is the time of salvation. That's when God declares, you are husband and wife to my son Jesus. So Peter had a lot to say about baptism. When he taught the gospel to Cornelius, who had been praying, by the way, for days, God, 
I want to be saved by you. God, send me a preacher to teach me about you. The man had been in prayers for days. In fact, the Bible says that Cornelius had prayed so much that his prayers had ascended, had reached the heaven of God. Gave this really powerful um, image. And so Peter goes and he preaches the gospel to him. Now we're not going to read the entire text. If you want to read it, it's Acts chapter 10 and verse 11. But Peter wanted to tell the early church, who were all Jews, he wanted to tell them about his experience. You know why? Because the Jews were racist. They didn't want to share the gospel with the Gentiles. Cornelius was the first Gentile to ever accept God's salvation in the biblical record. And so here's this man. He's a Roman uh, leader. He's a centurion. He has a lot of authority and power. He's praying for God to send him a messenger to tell him the good news of the gospel. And here comes Peter, preaches the word of God. And this is what happens. Look at what Peter said. And he, Cornelius, reported to us how he had seen an angel standing in his house saying, send to Joppa and have Simon, who is Peter, brought here. And look at, look at what it says. And he will speak words to you by which you will be saved, you and all your household. In other words, the things that Peter says is directly connected to your salvation. Well, what did Peter say? Acts chapter 10, verses 47 through 48. Surely... No one can refuse water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Why didn't Peter wait until Easter? Why didn't he wait until the quarterly baptismal Sunday? Why did he command them in this moment, be baptized? Well, he got the commandment from Jesus. And Jesus said, if you're going to make disciples in my name, you need to baptize them. Now, one of the errors that I have made myself and I've seen other people make is they say, well, hold on a second. The Holy Spirit came upon Cornelius and his household, and they began to speak in languages that they never studied. Wasn't that the time of salvation? There is a significant difference between the Holy Spirit in you and the Holy Spirit on you. The Holy Spirit in you is what you get for salvation. It's your seal of approval. The Holy Spirit coming upon someone was the empowerment to be able to do miraculous things. It happened in Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit came upon the apostles. They spoke in languages they never studied. It empowered them to do the work of ministry. John the Baptist, for instance, if you look at the early life of John the Baptist, it said the Spirit was upon John, even in the womb. Does that mean a little baby was saved when the Spirit came upon him? Even if you go throughout the entire Old Testament, there are times where the Spirit is upon him, the Spirit is upon him, and that was God enabling a person to do incredible works, miracles, wonders, or preach the Word. It was never an indicator for salvation. That's something that's very important. So Peter commanded them to receive the Holy Spirit in them. Why? Because God had empowered them with the Holy Spirit on them, and so there is a biblical difference there. What else did Peter have to say about baptism? 1 Peter 3, 21, look at what he says. Baptism now saves you. Well, hold on a second, Rick. I thought you said baptism doesn't save us. Faith saves us. Well, look at what he has to say. Not in the removal of the dirt from your flesh. There's no power in the water, is what he's saying. It's not because you've bathed yourself. Why is it? What is the significance of baptism at salvation? But an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus. It's where God meets your faith. It's the time of our salvation. Baptism saves us because our faith meets Jesus in the resurrection. Not because there's power in the water, not because we've already been saved and this is a symbol of what it means to be saved. No, he says baptism now saves you. Baptism is really significant. If you haven't been baptized in Jesus' name, you really ought to consider it. Maybe you've gone to church all your life. Maybe you were poured or sprinkled upon as an infant. I don't know what it is for you, but I want to really encourage you this morning. If you have not taken this step, this clear step of obedience and following Jesus, simply do it. If Jesus is Lord over your life and you want to follow him, why wouldn't you want to be baptized knowing how significant it really is? Now he uses this word appeal in this passage of scripture. This is the best translation, to request, to plea, a prayer. That when we are baptized, we are crying out, God, save me. Save my soul. Make me clean. I follow you. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. I publicly confess and declare, you are Jesus who is the Christ. Well, how about the Apostle Paul? Paul experienced the risen Lord on the road to Damascus. He was blind for three days. He spent three days in prayer. Very significant. 
You know, I've often offered people $1,000 if they can find what's called the sinner's prayer in the Bible. Can you find it? No, you can't. Offer still stands, by the way, if you think that you can find it. A thousand bucks, I'll give it to you, because it's simply not there. It's not what the Bible teaches. Paul prayed for three days, and yet look at what Paul had to say about his salvation experience. Acts chapter 9, verses 17 through 18. Ananias is preaching the gospel to brother Saul, and look at what he says. Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he received the Holy Spirit. Is that what it says? It says he got up, and he was baptized. You will receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. He received his sight and he got up and he was baptized. And when Paul shared his testimony, look at what he says in Acts chapter 22, verse 16. Ananias said this, why do you delay, Paul? Don't wait for baptismal Sunday. Don't wait for Easter next year. Why do you delay? Get up and be baptized, washing away your sins, calling on his name. Literally, as you are baptized, you are calling on the name of the Lord and he's washing your sins away. There's confidence in baptism. And this is what I often don't understand about people who don't want to be baptized or reject the doctrine of baptism. I think it's pretty clear in scripture. But why wouldn't you want to follow Jesus through his commands? Even if you didn't believe baptism was the time of salvation. Baptism is so significant. Even people who have believed baptism isn't the time of salvation says you can't be an authentic Christian if you haven't been baptized. Now, does that mean that God can't save anyone outside of baptism? Absolutely not. Look, God is sovereign. He can do whatever he wants. If he wants to save a person outside of baptism, he certainly can do that. But let us go off of what the evidence teaches us. What are the clear patterns of Scripture? What do we find the Bible explicitly saying? And then let's render our conclusion. Baptism is a whole lot more important than what some people think it is. Paul preached the gospel over and over again when he wrote to the church at Galatia. This is what the church at Galatia struggled with. Grace got you saved, but good works kept you saved. You ever felt like that? You come around the Lord's table on Sunday and you get resaved again for all the sins that you committed the previous week. That's, that's not what happens at the Lord's Supper, right? We take the Lord's Supper in response to salvation, not for salvation. You're saved by grace through faith, not how often you meet around the Lord's table. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't meet around the Lord's table, certainly, right? But that means that we are saved by grace through faith, not works. So when Paul preached the gospel, here's what he told the church of Galatia. He said this, you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Why? For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. It's a clothing. It's a burial. It's a circumcision. It's a washing away of your sins for the forgiveness of your sins. It's a time when God gives you the Holy Spirit. All of this evidence about baptism and then render our conclusion. One of my favorite passages of scripture is in Acts chapter 8, verses 34 through 38. I like Philip. Philip's a very zealous guy for the Lord. He never witnessed the ministry of Jesus, but he was an evangelist, set apart for the work of evangelism. And he goes anywhere he can preaching the gospel. And he's traveling around, uh, down this desert road, and here comes this chariot with a eunuch. The eunuch was traveling on his way back to Ethiopia. And he felt this conviction in his heart that I need to go up to this man. And he walks up to this man and the eunuch is reading the scroll of Isaiah. He was a Jewish convert. And he gets to Isaiah chapter 53 and he starts to read about this guy who was going to suffer, the suffering servant. And Philip comes up to the chariot and he says, hey man, what you reading? And he says, well, I'm reading the scroll of Isaiah basically. And he says, basically, I'm paraphrasing here. He says, but I don't know what it means unless somebody teaches me. And so Philip takes his time to get into the chariot and he starts to explain to him who this suffering servant is. And it says he began to preach the gospel to him. Now I want to read it to you. It says in verse 34, the eunuch answered Philip, who does this prophet say of this, of himself or of someone else? Who's Isaiah talking about? And look at Philip's response. Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. And as they went along the road, and they came to some water, the eunuch said, Look, water! What prevents me from being baptized? Now hold on just a minute. It said he preached Jesus to him. Why is the next response, Look, here's some water. What's preventing me from being baptized? Isn't it logically 
appropriate to conclude the preaching of Jesus included baptism. And so let's not overemphasize baptism, but let's certainly not undermine the importance of baptism. And look at what happens. He says, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? And then Philip said, if you believe with all of your heart, you may. You got to have faith. And he answered, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop. And Philip went down and grabbed a cup of water and brought it back up to the chariot and baptized him. No, that's not what it says, is it? I know I'm being a little funny here, okay? And I don't mean to poke fun at anybody. I'm just simply saying, look, the Bible's clear. They both went down into the water and they were baptized. They were immersed. That's what the biblical word meant. Baptizo, immersed. You got to have a lot of water. And so here is Philip the evangelist, preaching the gospel, sharing the word of the Lord, and he includes baptism as a necessary response. If baptism is not a part of the gospel or preaching Jesus, why did Philip include it in the gospel? It's because it is a part of the gospel. Now, if I haven't made it clear, I do want to make this clear. We reject baptismal regeneration. We do not believe there's power in the water and the water saves you. That's not what we believe the Bible teaches. There's no power in the water. There's power in the resurrection because you've placed your faith in Jesus. So a key phrase is simply this. Baptism is the time of salvation that occurs in the mind of God. It is not the means of salvation, which is faith. You know, sometimes we get ourselves into hot water, and I think one of the reasons why we do that is because You know, we can be so rigid and hard-hearted and legalistic in our preaching of baptism where we err on one side, but at the same time, we can sometimes not appreciate what the Bible has to say about baptism. And so we err on the other side that faith is so important, and it is. Without faith, we can't be saved. It would make no sense to baptize somebody without faith, as far as the Bible is concerned. But let's just look at the evidence. Let's just practice simple Christianity. Wherever the Bible leads us, let's follow that. That's the kind of church that we want to be. If we remember at the beginning of this year, we talked about how we want to be married to God. In order to do that, we've got to be divorced from the world. And sometimes that's divorced from our habits and our sinful lifestyles, while other times that's divorced from things that we maybe thought were true, but maybe they actually aren't. Or doctrines that we believed were true, but maybe they're false. And I would be lying if I stood before you today and I said, hey, I've got it all together and I know all there is to know about the Bible. I don't know that. All I can simply say is, look, I've looked at the evidence. I think the Bible's pretty clear. I don't think you're unsaved if you don't believe you're saved at the time of baptism. But I think it's important to get it right. And I want you to get it right. I want to be right. And so as I said earlier, I want to encourage you. If you have not been baptized, as Ananias told Paul, why do you delay? What are you waiting for? Arise now and be baptized, washing away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord.